Okay, so in this video I wanted to discuss a little bit of the science that was uh, that was talked about on this Joe Rogan Experience podcast with Dr. Robert Malone. Uh, and so this is concerning the uh, the coronavirus vaccines, in particular the mRNA vaccines, which Dr. Robert Malone was involved in. Uh, well, he wasn't involved in coming up specifically with the COVID-19 mRNA vaccines, but he was uh, instrumental in the development of mRNA vaccines in general. Uh, and so this is a fraught topic to, I guess, put it mildly. So I wanted to start with a little bit of a preamble before actually getting into the science. Uh, and I guess to start that preamble, I say specifically I'm going to get into the science of it and I'm not going to try and get into the sort of political debates or anything like that. I just want to strictly look at the science uh, that was discussed uh, on this Joe Rogan Experience podcast. And so as a preamble to this, because it's a fraught topic, I wanted to point out uh, a couple of things. And so people, when they are engaged in discussions on this topic, are prone to two, well, a lot of different biases, but uh, two in particular that I'm interested in here uh, in this little preamble is what's called motivated, motivated reasoning, reasoning. And the second one I wanted to discuss was called my side bias. And so motivated reasoning is, uh, is the human propensity to, to reason like a lawyer. So a lawyer uh, instead, instead of a scientist. And so what this means is a lawyer is somebody who has a conclusion already. Uh, so if they're a defendant, then it's their conclusion is, you know, my client is innocent. And if they're a prosecutor, then their conclusion is, you know, is, is the defendant, and I'll just put deef here, the defendant is guilty. So they, they start with these conclusions, uh, so guilty, I'll rewrite that a little bit. So they start with these conclusions, and then they try to argue for that case. So they start with a conclusion, then they go looking for arguments and evidence that proves their case, where a scientist, uh, and I'll even put here an ideal scientist, uh, is somebody who, uh, who gathers, gathers data first and then comes to a conclusion, comes to conclusion. And so the scientific method is, you know, humanity's best attempt to sort of mitigate this, this uh, motivated reasoning that everybody, everybody does. I do it, you do it. If you think you don't do it, then you're probably worse than the people who know that they do it. Uh, but everybody does this. Everybody has beliefs and then they go looking for evidence and arguments to support those beliefs. Everybody reasons like a lawyer. So the scientific method ideally is supposed to mitigate this because we're so in science, the sort of, you know, ideal science is that you are looking to falsify your hypothesis and only, you know, after you've gathered data, can you say, well, does the data uh, say that the, the hypothesis is wrong or right. Uh, and so that is what the, sci the scientific method is at least supposed to be. Obviously, scientists are people who are 
like everybody else, engaged in motivated reasoning. Uh, so the other one, which is very related, is my side bias. And this uh, is sort of observed in that uh, that people are are good at at uh, at refuting at refuting ideas they disagree with. They disagree with uh, bad uh, at refuting ideas they agree with. So people are quick to refute ideas that they disagree with. Uh, I put bat here, that should be bad bad at refuting ideas they agree with. So people are very credulous when uh, they are uh, presented with an argument or with evidence that, you know, goes, that supports what they already believe in. They're, they're likely to see it and go, oh yeah, that, that makes sense. That's, you know, that accords with what I already believe in, so uh, that must be true. Uh, whereas when they are presented with something that goes against what they believe in, they're going to be very good at picking out little inconsistencies and poking holes and things like that. And so, uh, and so with fraught issues like this with the COVID-19, these two things, this motivated reasoning, uh, we reason like a lawyer, we start with a conclusion, uh, and then with this my side bias, we can, if we're presented with something that goes against what we already believe in, then we're, we're good at nitpicking and finding all the little possible holes. Uh, but when we are presented with things that we do agree with, then we are bad at looking for those holes and logical inconsistencies and things like that. And we're going to be very credulous and uh, sort of just continue buying into it, even if it's a flawed argument or uh, a fallacious argument. Uh, but yeah, anyway, I just wanted to point this out because I think just in general, this is important to uh, remember, uh, you know, when you're doing your own research and you're uh, especially looking at places like news sites and things like that, uh, where people are, you know, trying to push an agenda most of the time, you're going to run into this. And so uh, this is kind of, uh, this gets into why I want to essentially just look at the science here, just look at what the science says about what uh, what uh, Dr. Robert Malone said. Uh, and this video is not supposed to be a debunking. I'm not trying to debunk Dr. Malone. I'm not trying to support him. Uh, I actually hadn't heard of him before until he was on the Joe Rogan podcast. So I don't have any sort of prior axe to grind with him or anything. Uh, I just want to look at the science and see what that says. Uh, and so, like I said, this is not a debunking video, but this is also not, you know, a, you know, pro Robert Malone, you know, I'm on his side and this is why he's right kind of video. This, uh, I'm trying to, as best as possible, uh, not engage in motivated reasoning or my side bias. I just want to sort of look at the science to uh, read to you what the actual scientific papers say. Uh, and, you know, then you can, I guess, come to your own conclusion uh, using your own motivated reasoning and my side biases, I, I suppose, since uh, those things are pretty much inescapable. Uh, and so I guess to kind of lay my biases out on the table before getting into the science here. Uh, so uh, I am vaccinated. So I am vaccinated. Uh, I have I have two Pfizer. I got my first two were the Pfizer, and then I have my my booster, which is the uh, the. Moderna. So both of them are the the mRNA vaccines. So I'm 36 
years old as I'm making this video. So, you know, take what you want from that, what, you know, whatever cohort I'm in. Uh, I'm also overweight uh, and I, uh, I don't, I don't uh, exercise, exercise very much. Uh, but uh, I did not experience any side effects. So I did not uh, experience any side effects from getting vaccinated. Uh, so I guess to lay my sort of political biases, uh, I am against, against, uh, that should have, I misspelled that, against, against uh, the, the, uh, the mandates. So I do not think there should be mandates. I'm against COVID mandates. I don't think the government should be mandating them. I think a private business can say, uh, you know, if you want to enter my private business, then you have to be vaccinated or you have to wear a mask or whatever. But I don't think the government should mandate uh, masks. I don't think the government should mandate vaccines. So that's sort of my uh, political stance on this. I'm for va getting vaccinated, but I'm against mandates, I guess is sort of to sum it up. All right, now to actually get into uh, some of the meat of this here. So I first wanted to point out this, uh, this here, which is called the Tangled History of mRNA Vaccines, which came out in September of this year in Nature. Uh, and it has this nice uh, little timeline here of the history of mRNA vaccines. So uh, it's showing, you know, back here in 1961, mRNA was first discovered. Uh, so you can go through here and you get up to 1989 and 1990. So this is the synthetic RNA cationic liposomes. So this is the stuff that uh, Dr. Robert Malone actually did right here. Uh, and so this is just showing uh, a timeline of uh, sort of the, the big events in the development of mRNA vaccines. Uh, so we can see back here in, uh, what is it, 2013 uh, was the first clinical trial of an mRNA vaccine against rabies. Uh, and then we can kind of zoom up to here. Uh, so mRNA-based COVID-19 vaccines win emergency authorization in 2020. Uh, but anyway, this will be the link, the first link in the description down below. And as usual, everything I'll be talking about here will be linked to in the description down below. Uh, but if you're interested in sort of the story of how mRNA vaccines came to be, then this will be the first link in the description down below. All right, and so this is a art, an article that... Uh, Dr. Robert Malone actually uh, sort of cited specifically in the Joe Rogan experience uh, video. And so this was looking at, uh, at uh, sort of, well, what he used it for was saying that the uh, spike protein after taking the mRNA vaccine uh, ends up in the blood. And I think he specifically said that it's in the blood for weeks after getting the mRNA vaccine. Uh, so this is looking at, so this mRNA1273 is the uh, Moderna version. And so in this study, there were 13 nurses. So it's a pretty small sample size of 13 nurses who uh, received the vaccine and they wanted to look at uh, how much the, the, the spike protein actually reduced in the bloodstream over time. And so uh, I've kind of fast forwarded here to sort of the, the punchline of this. Uh, you can read through the whole thing if you want. Like I said, it'll be linked to in the description down below. But uh, so after the first 100 microgram dose, the uh, the Moderna vaccine produced detectable levels of S1 antigen. So that's the S1 uh, 
subunit of the spike protein. So the spike protein has an S1 and S2, uh, which are cleaved from each other uh, during the, the viral infection uh, process. And so the S1 uh, kind of gets cleaved off and that's what ends up uh, in the blood if you get a COVID-19 infection. Uh, and so this is looking at S1 antigen in the plasma uh, of these nurses. And so in the plasma of 11 participants, the spike antigen was detected in three of 13 participants. Uh, so the nucleocaspid antigen, which uh, is another protein in the COVID-19 virus, uh, which is not present in the um, in the vaccine, and so that's why they use it as a negative control. So they uh, look for the nucleocaspid to see that all of the the spike protein that are, that they are detecting actually comes from the vaccine and not from you know getting an infected you know sometime after getting the vaccine. So nucleocaspid antigen was undetectable or at background levels in all participants uh, as expected. All right, so the S1 antigen was detected as early as day one post-vaccination and peak levels were detected on average five days after the first injection. Uh, the mean S1 peak level was 68 picograms per milliliter plus, plus or minus 21 picograms per milliliter. S1 in all participants declined, became undetectable by day 14. Uh, no antigen was detected at day zero for 12 of 13 participants as expected. However, one individual presented detectable S1 on day zero, possibly due to assay cross reactivity with other human coronaviruses or asymptomatic infection at the time of vaccination. Spike protein was detectable in three of the 13 participants an average of 15 days after the first injection. The mean spike peak level was 62 picograms per milliliter. After the second vaccine dose, no S1 or spike was detectable. Uh, and by the way, the, the, they were getting the second dose 28 days after the first dose that uh, was listed uh, somewhere up here. Uh, uh, yeah, somewhere in here, or it's in the, um, I think it might have been in this, which is the supplemental material. Uh, but anyway, the, so what this is saying, though, is uh, that the S1 spike protein, or the antigen, which is, you know, the S1 spike protein, uh, was not detectable for weeks. It was uh, only detectable in, in, uh, for up to five days after the first injection. Uh, then down here, after the second vaccine dose, no S1 or spike was detectable, uh, and both antigens remain undetectable through day 56. Uh, for one individual, spike was detected at day 29, one day after the second injection, and was undetectable two days later. Uh, and you, we can actually look at this in their uh, their um, their supplementary material here. So this is for each participant. So this top graph here is the antigen uh, days on the bottom uh, in concentration. So this is the one participant where they found uh, the the spike protein antigen. Uh, here on day 29, and then it went down to zero. Uh, and so you can see on all these other ones that that spike protein antigen uh, was staying low, uh, well, pretty much, you know, after, after just a few days after their first injection. Uh, and so, you know, the, the, so once again, these are for each participant looking at these top graphs on here, uh, looking at the antigen. These, these bottom graphs are looking at the different uh, immunoglobulins present. Uh, but so the idea here is, you know, these spike proteins are not found uh, for very long after injection of the, uh, of the, the vaccine. And so it's kind of a, a stretch to 
to interpret this data as saying that that spike protein stays in the bloodstream for weeks after it's after the vaccine is administered. Uh, and in fact, there was only that one out of 13 participants that uh, actually had it around uh, for much longer uh, than just a few days after after the injection. And all of them had none of it after the second in, in injection. And so what that's saying is that uh, the, the, these uh, IgG and IgA and IgM, these, these antibodies are actually neutralizing the spike protein. And so uh, after a, a second dose of the vaccine, we're not, they're not seeing any of these uh, spike antigens in the bloodstream. Uh, and so that, that's kind of important to remember when you are uh, interpreting this data. So it's showing that like I said, uh, that the that this spike protein is not staying in the bloodstream for uh, for days after or for weeks after the injection, as uh, Dr. Robert Malone uh, intimated in the in the uh, Joe Rogan podcast interview. All right, so. One of the other things he talked about was uh, was SARS-CoV-2 entering the blood-brain barrier, uh, and so I have a couple of articles here talking about that. I've highlighted a few things. So this is just giving um, so the impact of SARS-CoV-2 on the blood-brain barrier structure and function. Uh, so these are sort of uh, mechanisms that could possibly be be uh, responsible for allowing the virus to enter the the brain. So the blood-brain barrier, so what it is showing in the top up here, the top left, the blood-brain barrier is not, you know, like this sort of wall in front of the brain that, you know, like this wall around the brain. It's more that these astrocytes, which control sort of blood flow to to and from neurons uh, are able to sort of filter out certain things uh, from the blood before it actually gets into the neurons. So there were a few things I had highlighted on here I wanted to show. So uh, a recent study using primary human in vitro blood brain barrier models has shown that components of these SARS CoV-2 spike protein, including S1 and S2, and the receptor binding domain can all cause blood-brain barrier leakage in the absence of toxicity. Uh, induction of blood-brain barrier leakage occurred in response to glycosylated and non-glycosylated forms of S1 and S2. Infection of primary human endothelial cells and overexpressed ACE2 uh, with SARS-CoV-2 induced the overexpression of clotting factors, adhesion molecules, and pro-inflammatory cytokines, as well as formation of multinucleate uh, synchytia and endothelial cell lysis. Together, these data suggest that SARS-CoV-2 infection and contact with viral proteins could contribute to brain endothelial dysfunction and damage. Uh, so this is talking about SARS-CoV-2 infection. So this is uh, this is uh, not talking about the um, the vaccine in particular. All right. So some coronaviruses, for example, MERS-CoV-2 and SARS-CoV-1, can infect immune cells, which has led to speculation that SARS-CoV-2 may enter the brain via infected immune cells. Uh, so, yeah, I think this was the part I really wanted to focus on. So ACE2 is to play a dominant role in uptake of SARS-CoV-2 by all tissues, including the brain barriers and central nervous system tissue. However, several studies have presented various types of results indicating that S1 could use other glycoproteins as receptors or co-receptors, uh, including some of these different um, proteins uh, here. In the S1 study, and I'll look at this study uh, 
itself here in, in a minute. Evidence suggests the role for S1 uptake into brain but was also suggestive that other binding sites may also play a role. In contrast, ACE2 played a much larger role for uptake by the lung, but little or no role for uptake by other tissues, suggesting other binding sites could be more important for their uptake. At present, our interpretation is that ACE2 is important in brain uptake, but may not be the only binding site involved. As a corollary of the S1 study, ACE2 is likely much more involved in lung uptake, but other binding sites may play, may be key in viral uptake by other tissues. Given the experimental design in the S1 study, the vascular blood-brain barrier is likely a site of entry into brain. ACE2 is expressed on the epithelial cells, which comprise the choroid plexus of the SARS, and SARS-CoV-2 can infect those cells in vitro. This suggests that the virus likely enters brain at both vascular blood-brain barrier and choroid plexus. And so this uh, the study they're talking about, which is their uh, reference 162, is this one right here. So the S1 protein of SARS-CoV-2 crosses blood-brain barrier in mice. Uh, and so down here, so we obtain S1 proteins from two commercial sources. Uh, we determined whether intravenously injected IS1 could cross the blood-brain barrier in mice by measuring its blood-to-brain influx constant. And so this is important to remember here, uh, is that they are injecting these this uh, S1 uh, subunit of the spike protein intravenously in this study, uh, as opposed to intramuscularly, uh, like what you get when you uh, get the, uh, the vaccine. And so here is uh, their data for this. So this KI is essentially uh, the ability of, of the spike to enter through the blood-brain barrier. And so uh, they can, we can see that this is higher than these, um, than these, uh, these controls here. So the 0.295 and 0.304 is you know, several orders of magnitude higher than these controls, which is indicating that this is entering the blood-brain barrier. Uh, and you can read through this whole uh, article if you want. It's, you know, it's interesting, but also quite technical. Uh, but as far as the blood-brain barrier <clears throat> issue, so like I said, the one thing to keep in mind is that this is looking at intravenous uh, intravenous injection rather than intramuscular, and it's looking at intravenous injection of S1 protein rather than intramuscular injection of mRNA. Uh, and so I also found these nice articles here on Medium. These will be linked to in the description down below. So they're all by uh, this guy Shinji Yong, and uh, he talks about so uh, so. Dr. Malone talked a bit about this uh, this Japanese biodistribution study in the um, in the interview, and so uh, these articles talk a bit about this study. So the Japanese biodistribution study, and I'll have that study linked, even though it's uh, it's in Japanese and I can't read Japanese, which is why I had to uh, find. Um, find sort of a blogger, I guess, who uh, was able to interpret the data because I can't read Japanese. So the Japanese biodistribution study of Pfizer's mRNA vaccine has also found that 0.02% and 0.009% of the vaccine administered dose ended up in the brain at two hours and 48 hours respectively. Uh, then he says down here, this Japanese study has also been widely misused to push the notion that mRNA vaccine could concentrate in the ovaries. These biodistribution data are discussed more in depth here. Uh, and so that's actually this article right here. Uh, 
Uh, and so I'll read through this. So basically the numbers highlighted in yellow he's talking about in this image, which is a figure in this uh, Japanese biodistribution study. The numbers highlighted in yellow refer to total lipid content, including both the RNA vaccines, lipid nanoparticles, and lipid tracer. Thus, the more appropriate numbers to look at would be the percent of administered dose highlighted in cyan over here. Now, the numbers are no longer nerve-wracking. Only, only less than 1% of the injected mRNA vaccine got into the ovaries, adrenal glands, heart, brain, and other tissues at 48 hours. Most of the vaccine remained in the injection site and went into the liver, suggesting these lipid nanoparticles may be eliminated mostly via hepatic or, you know, i.e. liver clearance route. And so you can see, uh, if we zoom in here, the small percentages here uh, of, of this in these different tissues uh, at, at different times here. Uh, even the dose the Japanese study uses very high when controlled for weight that is 18 to 35 times higher than what is injected into humans. Uh, as David H. Gorski, a professor of surgery and blogger explained, the human vaccine contains 0.46 milligrams lipids or 460 micrograms. That's just, let's just round up to 500 micrograms. That's approximately 10 times the dose given to the rats. However, for the typical 70 kilogram male, 0.5 milligrams represents a per weight dose of 0 0.0071 milligrams per kilogram. Let's compare that with the rats, which generally weigh around 200 grams. That would translate to a per weight dose of 250 micrograms per kilogram uh, compared to the 7.1 micrograms per kilograms in humans. That would translate to a... So even if you used much older rats who can weigh as much as twice as much, that would still translate to a dose of 125 micrograms per kilogram. So we're looking at a lipid nanoparticle dose 18 to 35 times higher as a, as a rough estimate than the typical adult human dose. Uh, the Japanese biodistribution study results are consistent with Pfizer's that was submitted to the European Medicines Agency in February of 2021. Pfizer also found that uh, lipid nanoparticle encapsulated mRNA vaccine was mainly metabolized in the liver and did not enter other tissues easily. They also noted no effects on fertility or ovarian functions. Uh, and so the take home message here, uh, essentially being that the the rats uh, that the that were injected in this this uh, this Japanese uh, this Japanese study, they were injected with a huge amount compared to their weight, and they, yet they found only a small amount of it uh, actually in peripheral tissues or tissues outside of uh, of where the injection was placed so in places like the the liver and brain and so forth and so it doesn't seem like this uh this uh japanese uh study here this japanese biodistribution study really supports this idea that there is this you know huge issue uh of the of it going into the brain uh, though I did find this study here which uh, looked at two different patients uh, who did end up getting neurological cases uh, after they were vaccinated uh, and so I put this I highlighted this because this is from uh, June of 2021 uh, and so uh, and so the, these two people these two so they, they have case one and case two. They, they looked at two people who did end up with neurological effects. Uh, and we hypothesized that a post-vaccine inflammatory response resulted in the hyperacute presentation of these lesions. These cases further emphasize the need to cautiously consider and evaluate new neurologic symptoms following COVID-19 vaccinations. So you can look at the actual cases if you want. I'll sort of uh, 
jump to the punchline here. So we, re we report two cases of new onset neurological symptoms after COVID-19 vaccination. In both cases, further diagnostic testing revealed neuro-oncologic, so that's uh, cancer, uh, you know, oncologist is a cancer doctor, uh, neuro-oncologic process that required neurosurgical intervention. Administration of these vaccines was unrelated to the oncologic diagnoses themselves. However, these two independent processes both came to the clinical forefront following vaccination. We hypothesize that the inflammatory response to the COVID vaccine may have played a role in increasing clinical symptoms in these patients, uh, potentially in relation to the COVID-19 spike protein. I'm gonna kind of skip down to here. Although the precise mechanism of post-vaccination inflammation is unknown, it is known that spike proteins can initiate inflammatory cascades and cross the blood-brain barrier in COVID-19 infections. It is possible that encoded spike proteins post-vaccination therefore cross the blood-brain barrier and enhance inflammatory responses to nascent pathology. Uh, so it's essentially saying that there was already a pathology there uh, and that this uh, the vaccine sort of uh, sort of made it uh, worse, I guess, uh, made it so it was no longer nascent, so made it so that it was present. Uh, so uh, the blood-brain barrier enhanced inflammatory response to nascent pathology within the brain following vaccine administration. We believe that an augmented inflammatory response following vaccination called attention to these neuro-oncologic diseases by exacerbating uh, paratumoral edema and worsening clinical symptoms. Uh, and so there is this study here, like I said, it's looking at two cases where it seems that uh, it's possible that that the the vaccine caused um, caused nascent issues to actually sort of uh, start presenting. And so, like I said, so the take home message on the blood brain barrier thing is that it does seem that the spike protein can cross the blood brain barrier. Uh, that's what this study here was showing. So when the spike protein itself is injected intravenously, then it does cross the blood brain barrier. Uh, but if we look at this, uh, this Japanese uh, biodistribution study uh, where they inject between 18 and 35 times as much of the vaccine into mice, uh, they do get small amounts of it actually going to uh, different organs such as uh, the brain and the liver and, and uh, places like that. All right, so one of the other things that was talked about in the video was uh, the mRNA COVID vaccines causing myocarditis in, uh, and in particular in adolescents. Uh, so I don't think this article, uh, so this article was essentially just saying that uh, even though this, uh, this Hong Kong article, which I think was referenced in the video specifically, uh, even though it found some cases of myocarditis, uh, they are still uh, telling people to get the COVID vaccine. Uh, but if we look at uh, some of these actual studies here, uh, so I'll go down here. So in this population-based cohort study of uh, of a little under 2.4 million individuals who received at least one dose of COVID-19 mRNA vaccines. Acute myocarditis was rare at an incidence of 5.8 cases per 1 million individuals after the second dose uh, and one case in 172,414 fully vaccinated individuals. The signal of increased myocarditis in young men warrants further investigation. Uh, then they kind of go into some of the, the uh, the limitations of their study. Uh, so here, SARS-CoV-2 vaccination and myocarditis or myopericarditis population-based cohort study. So I will scroll down to the punchline here. So uh, among cohort members, uh, a little over 4 million were vaccinated 
with a SARS-CoV-2 vaccine during follow-up uh, with about three and a half million individuals vaccinated with the BNT. So that's the uh, Pfizer, yeah, the Pfizer, and then 498,000 uh, individuals vaccinated with the Moderna, while the remaining vaccinated individuals were vaccinated with the Johnson & Johnson. On the vaccinated cohort, uh, 3.4 million individuals vaccinated with Pfizer and uh, 483,000 vaccinated with the uh, with the Moderna had received both vaccines. All right, so during follow-up, 269 individuals had myocarditis or myopericarditis, of whom 108 or 40% were in the 12 to 39 years old and 196 were male. So 73% of them were male. So males seem to be uh, 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 more highly represented uh, in people who get the myocarditis. Among individuals vaccinated with the Pfizer and Moderna, 48 and 28 individuals had myocarditis or myopericarditis within 28 days of vaccination, respectively. Overall, individuals vaccinated with Pfizer had a non-significantly increased rate of myocarditis or myopericarditis in the 28 days after vaccination compared to unvaccinated follow-up uh, adjusted hazard ratio of 1.34. So the adjusted hazard ratio is essentially the uh, number of or the percentage of people uh, who got the vaccine and got myocarditis uh, uh, of people, yeah, of people who got myocarditis after getting the vaccine, divided by the number of people who got myocarditis who did not get the vaccine. So, uh, so, and I think uh, where was that? Yeah, so this, so you can we we can see here, uh, this is the hazard ratio. So unvaccinated divided by unvaccinated is obviously going to be equal to one, uh, and so. If we do the uh, Pfizer divided by the unvaccinated, uh, we get this 1.37 to 2.64, uh, and then adjusted. Uh, so the adjusted hazard ratio. So adjusting for uh, for things like age, sex, and priority group season, and clinical comorbidities. Uh, then it goes down to 1.34. Uh, and they, they say that it's not uh, significant because it's still within this uh, confidence interval, which is between 0.9 and 2. So if it's within the confidence interval, then uh, it is not statistically significant. Uh, but it was saying up here... Uh, yeah, so 1.3, so yeah, that's the confidence interval, the 0.9 to 2 uh, after adjustment for age, sex, vaccine priority, and so on. Among individuals 12 to 39 years old, we also found a non-significantly increased rate in the 28 days after vaccination. Individuals vaccinated with the Moderna had a significantly increase. So uh, in you know usual parlance, you would think significant, well, that must mean big, but what that is talking about is statistically significant uh, so uh, the it's uh, the confidence interval is out or the one is outside the confidence interval so one being sort of the null hypothesis that uh, that there is no change uh, is outside the confidence interval for the moderna vaccine and so that's telling us that there is that there does seem to be at least some small uptick in the amount of, uh, of myocarditis and myopericarditis uh, compared with the unvaccinated uh, population. And so uh, that's what this is saying up here. But then they also tested for cardiac arrest or death. And they actually found that the vaccinated populations had lower rates of cardiac arrest or death uh, compared to the unvaccinated. 
So over here, the overall absolute rate of myocarditis or myopericarditis within 28 days of SARS-CoV-2 mRNA vaccination was 1.7, 95% uh, confidence interval 1.3 to 2.2 uh, per 100,000 vaccinated individuals. The rates of the of the uh, Pfizer and the Moderna vaccination separately were 1.4 and 4.2 per 100,000 individuals within 28 days of vaccination, respectively. Uh, so yeah, that is uh, so that is telling us that at least with the Moderna vaccine, there does seem to be some uh, statistically significant uptick in the number of cases of uh, of myocarditis and myopericarditis, uh, where the Pfizer in this study, which uh, as I said had uh, had several million people in the um, yeah, so among cohort members, so f a little over 4 million uh, people in the sample size. So that's uh, a pretty robust data set for that. Uh, so, yeah, these, um, these other, these other uh, articles that I have open up here, I'm not going to go through the, well, I think I have some things highlighted here. Uh, but I'm not going to go through these uh, individually because each one of these articles could uh, be, you know, an entire video unto themselves. But uh, th these are definitely interesting to look at. And they're looking at uh, how, how the vaccines and the virus affect the um affect your immune system and it does seem to have some you know sort of weird effects uh, you know with how it affects the T cells and stuff so this is what I found while looking into because uh, because uh, in the interview uh, in the interview he talks about how there's this sort of you know this T cell uh, this T cell uh, suppression going on and that it can increase infection rates of other things like the cytomegalovirus and things like that and uh, there does seem to be some weird things going on with uh, the immune system how it uh, it reprograms both the adaptive uh, and the innate immune response so adaptive is the one that we are sort of trying to reprogram with a vaccine we want to uh, have an adaptive immune response against the virus. That's what the vaccine is trying to do. But uh, in this one, for instance, it, it also found uh, innate immune responses, which is sort of your just general frontline immune response. And uh, it found, you know, some some genes have been sort of uh, down-regulated while other ones are up-regulated. And there seems to be different responses to other viruses. Uh, you know, the, it's still not clear like uh, how big of a a change this is, but uh, you know, it does. There does seem to be some changes to it uh, when you get these uh, these mRNA vaccines. Um, but yeah, uh, I like I said, these will all be left in the description down below uh, if you want to look in them into them yourself. Uh, Maybe in the future, I will go over each of these papers individually in their own separate videos. Uh, but these these papers are really long. They're very technical. Uh, so it, it will take me a bit more time to sort of digest them and come up with a way of actually uh, sort of presenting them. But yeah, if you want to look into them, then I would uh, highly recommend looking into those uh, if you are interested. Uh, but, but anyway, I hope you found this video uh, at least somewhat illuminating, uh, whether you've you know watched this interview or not. And if you haven't, I would recommend going and watching it. And uh, I would recommend you know looking into all the claims that he makes for yourself. Uh, you know that it's a three-hour interview and. There's a lot of things covered in it, uh, including, you know, more speculative things about, you know, why, uh, why people might want to lie about possible, 
you know, negative uh, detrimental side effects of the vaccines and things like that. So things that are sort of outside the science, uh, which is sort of what I wanted to focus on here, uh, sort of, you know, specifically, I, I didn't want to get too much into sort of the, the politics and the speculation of who's lying and, you know, why they're lying and, and things like that. Uh, I do definitely agree with Dr. Malone that, that there, it, there does seem to be sort of a, I don't know, this weird chilling effect where, uh, where the, the free uh, discussion of this issue is sort of not allowed. And, you know, that is quite worrying. So, you know, I will sort of uh, proffer that as my opinion on sort of the political side of this. Uh, so I think some of the, the scientific claims that he makes uh, are not really all that well supported. Uh, but, you know, some of them are supported. And, you know, there, there were a lot of points in the interview where he says, you know, this thing or that thing is happening, but there, are, there isn't science on it because, you know, the powers that be won't let there be science on it. And then, you know, that always kind of begs the question, so how do you know that these things are happening if there isn't science on it yet? Uh, but, you know, but I, I agree with him in that if if these things do seem to be popping up, if there's even anecdotal evidence of it, then it does seem like it would be incumbent on the scientific community to look into those things and find out if there is any veracity to them. Uh, but anyway, I don't want to go too far down this rabbit hole. This is something, I mean, this is, a, like I said, a three-hour interview if you want to you know, go down that rabbit hole even further. But this video is already getting long enough. Uh, I hope you found this uh, at least somewhat illuminating in your journey to better understand this complex and fraught issue. Uh, and I will see you in another video.